And yeah, well, I would say, uh, you know, talking about adjusting, becoming a parent so quickly, because I've had other people on the podcast, too, and they talked about when I got married, I accept, I, that child was mine. You know, that, that was the decision. You know, what that child came with the with the individual. Yep. But you had a unique situation because a lot of parents, it, well, both people are parents, and then they get married, and then they have mixed families, right? Yep. Yep. But you were not. So kind of yep. talk about the struggle with that, kind of how you overcame that. What is going on, guys? Dr. Jared Nelson in the house, the podcast, The Better Man, where you can never be perfect, but you can always be better. Today, we have a very special guest with us today, Adam Stanfield. How's it going? going? What's going on, dude? Uh, Nothing much. Glad to have you in here. We've got a lot to talk about. We've got some business type stuff, Yeah. food industry, lots of interesting stuff there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I started off like this. You're in the gym. Somebody sees you, and they say, you look so familiar where do I know you from? Go ahead and start off, dude. Probably from selling a restaurant or I'm in and out of restaurants, hospitals, nursing homes, sister livings. Uh, I mean, that or my uncle and them on local Joe's Trading Post in Rainbow City. I worked there for years. Mm-hmm. So, that's how so I got who started. are you? What's your name? What do you do? My name's Adam Stanfield. I got a, I'm a, I got a wife, a kid named Gracie. Uh, Katie Stanfield's my wife and Gracie Moore's my daughter mm-hmm. and uh, I'm a food salesman nothing awesome. sexy about it just everyday working man everyday working man blue collar absolutely that's right that's what we're talking about <laughs> don't work too hard now that's don't. right we gotta we gotta keep it in check so <clears throat> we're gonna start off with this you said you are a husband you have yes. a wife uh, yes. how long have you been married it was actually eight years just a couple weeks ago eight years man that's yep, crazy babe, we've I, been together for 10 years yeah 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 I remember when y'all first started dating everything that was it seems yeah, like you know i never thought uh especially at at that time i was 22 never thought i was gonna settle down at that age yeah never thought it one bit um i would hate to say i was wild as a buck but in some aspects i was yeah and so no party no drinking but females were an issue yeah, so talk about that a little bit, settling down. What made you kind of want to do that? Do you feel like when people meet the right person, they're ready and it's time? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's still going to be struggles regardless, but I do think that me knowing her for, I mean, I've got pictures. She's two years older than me. We went to school from middle, elementary school, middle school, high school. Mm-hmm. And um, it all started basically just, you know, I was on Facebook one day and I just messaged her to see how she'd been doing. I hadn't talked to her in probably since high school, really. To so be you honest knew your with wife you. in high school? Yep, knew her and everything. Uh, I've even got pictures where I was at her birthday party at her house when I was like six years old. She was eight. Oh, wow. And so, I mean, it's a pretty cool thing. Uh, I've known her for cougar. a long time. She was yeah, at yeah, oh, She's the cougar. Look out, look out. <laughs> so, um, but besides that, you know, and my biggest thing was I never wanted to, to actually be with somebody that I already had a kid from a previous marriage. Mm-hmm. I never wanted that. And uh, it's funny. God's got a sense of humor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was like, golly, mm-hmm. but it's all worked out for the good. And I, I mean, I, I, I've been pretty blessed. Let's just say that. Yeah. We'll definitely talk about but having being a step parent and all that yeah. challenges, different things you encounter with that. Absolutely. But I do want to stay on the marriage thing. So you've been married eight years. Yeah. Uh, trials, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm also trials about that. Yeah, she's not perfect like me, but I mean, uh, yeah. she she gets there. I mean, it's it's just one of those things. She's she'll get there. It's a work in progress with it. It's always a work in progress. Absolutely, right? that's right. So with trials and stuff, I want to uh, talk about conflict resolution. So handling conflict, I think in relationship in general, conflict is going to arise. Absolutely. Uh, what kind of approach do you take? What have you seen work and all that? What's what's the secret, man? Man, you know. You got to give and you got to take a little. Yeah. Uh, even if this is going to sound crazy, even if you know that you're right, sometimes it's not worth the argument. Yeah. Especially you got to pick your battles. I mean, which I learned a lot over the last eight, basically 10 years, but really eight years of being married. Everything ain't got to be an argument. Mm-hmm. There is some things that I'm passionate about and she knows, and it's, it's one of those things like I will fight it tooth and nail, but you know, for the most part, I'm easy going. It's the little things for me that set me off or I'm like, Hey, what's going on with that? Like not the big things. I'm just like, Hey, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, for the most part, we don't argue. Yeah. Once every blue moon, there may be like, Hey, what are you doing? Like, I don't agree with that. 
Um, you know, but there's really, I've got a really good marriage and I've got a great wife. So I, I can't say we have a lot of conflict. Um, you know, you're going to have some, but not a lot really. Yeah. So you said you had a great marriage that took a lot of work. I'm sure it does take a lot of work. Yeah. It takes a lot of work. Uh, So talk about the work there, kind of what it took. Uh, did you have kind of more conflict before you've gotten through those hurdles now it's better or or oh yeah it's way better yeah i mean there were conflict on the side of me being a step parent and also having to learn how to raise a child it's not Mm -hmm. one of those things that most people i wouldn't say most nowadays but back in the day you would have a man and woman get together they have a child and Mm -hmm. then they learn how to raise a child together at the same time, they're going to have the same trials and everything else. Well, as a step parent, you step right into the role of being a dad without any training, without anything. So you've literally got to learn on the fly. And it, there's going to be a lot of trial and errors. And the worst shit, I wouldn't handle it that way. Mm. And I'm like, well, I don't know how to handle it any other way. I've only been raised with boys. Like, that's how I want to handle it. Right. And I've learned through so many years now of, hey, you can't train. You cannot discipline boys the same way you do girls there's there's some hurdles and you can't say certain things to girls that you would say to a boy it'll set them off on a whole different spectrum yeah you know so there's been some trial and tribulations there i love being a girl dad now i mean i i really probably wouldn't have it any other way to be honest with you i mean i love having the girls i mean you got gracie and all of her friends that come over and hang out and it's like they're a bunch of fun and Mm. you really would be like Oh God, they're teenage girls, but for the most part, man, she's got great friends, and so we have a really good time together, and um, it, it's a blast. And yeah, well, I would say, uh, you know, talking about adjusting, becoming a parent so quickly, because I've had other people on the podcast too, and they talked about when I got married, I, accept, I that child was mine. You 100%. know, that that was the decision. You know, what that child came with the with the individual. Yep. But you had a unique situation because a lot of parents. Well, both people are parents, and then they get married, and then they have mixed families, right? Yep, yep. But you were not. So kind of yep. talk about the struggle with that, kind of how you overcame that. You know, it was one of those things that I was like, you have to learn. You Like I said, you have to learn to parent. But, you know, I right when I stepped into the role, it was like, okay, I'm dad. Like, this is not. This is like, they're going to look up to you. They're always watching. Right. Regardless if you don't think they are or not. And have obviously I made mistakes. Everybody does. Uh, and now she's old enough. Now she'll call me out. I'm like, Hey, what? That's not right. <laughs> like, it's like, okay, Hey, listen, you got too much your mama in you. Right. Um, but it has been a struggle in some aspects of it. The last, I would probably say four years have been pretty good. Mm. Last three to four years have been really good uh, to where, you know, you had to build that trust. And we've had to grow together. We've had to, we've had some struggles ourselves. Um, and so, uh, and she also asked here from the other side of her family, you know, and so there's a lot that I would like to do, but you can't because you may upset somebody else on the other side of the family or, or you know, and so I don't want to upset anybody. So I just stay back and everything. Sure. So, well, picking there, your battles. You, huh? Yeah. You got to pick your battles because if not, you're just going to be miserable in all aspects. Because if mm-hmm. not, if you're upsetting the child uh, or if and then you upset the parent and the mother or ever how it goes, vice versa, mm-hmm. you know. So however that is, you need to make sure that you're going about everything the right way, because I had to learn the hard way with my wife. She was like, listen, don't talk to me. You shouldn't handle it that way. And I'm like, well, how am I supposed to handle this? Yeah. And actually just saying, OK, hey, can we discuss this? You're right. Mm-hmm. Like. Because I don't know how to raise a girl. I don't know how to raise a kid. I'm learning. So be patient with me as well. Don't try to correct. Now, if it's getting way out of hand, obviously correct. But if they're disciplined a certain way that you don't want, and it, you know, okay, step aside, don't correct the other parent in front of the other parent because they're going to be like, oh, see, I told you. And it's like, no, it ain't about that. So do it behind closed doors so the the child actually knows, like, hey, mama or daddy's got, you know, they have the same respect as in, she backs him, he backs her type deal. Right. Well, want- it's a sense of respect there. And like yeah. you said, in relationships too, like if you're in a group of people, right, yeah. never talk about your wife or yell at you in front of no. mixed kind of, you know, do that, talk to them behind closed doors mm-hmm. and stuff and correct and all that. Yep. I think that's a similar situation with the child. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, because it's a respect issue. Because if you do that in front of people, it's they kind of look at you sideways like that's not very respectful. Yeah, no. respect is a big thing for me. Yeah. Like that is probably the one thing I'm like, hey, wait, hold on. <laughs> 
we're you need to slow your roll, kid, or whoever it is. Respect's huge for me. Mm-hmm. You can do whatever you want to, but if you start disrespecting me, hey, like we need to have a conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, respect is a huge thing, especially in our household. Yeah, respect well, think, goes a long way. Well, I've heard people say for men, uh, women, it's love. For men, it's respect. 100%. As far as what they value in a relationship yeah. and all that. Um, and I think love is key, general. but respect is also key on both sides. Sure, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, good stuff, man. Uh, got a good marriage. So talking about dating, you uh, were a little bit of a bachelor back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave a lot of stories unsaid. Yeah, but I will let's say, just do that. I, I will say, <laughs> but I will say this. So dating then versus now. You see dating now. Dating apps. I wouldn't. You see. Okay. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, <laughs> Golly. Without getting in trouble. It's tough out there, man. Uh, well, I don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, <laughs> you know, really, uh, today's day and age, it's, uh, and I'm not even that, we're not that old. We're not. And mm. it's crazy. Um, you know, and I, I, my girl, she's 14. So there's really not a, there's an age gap. Obviously, there's 18 years between me and her. But seeing what they do dating wise, it's like, y'all don't even know how to date. They don't know how to conversate. I think that's the biggest key in dating nowadays. There's no communication. It's, hey, I'm going to snap you a picture of what I'm doing, or hey, I'm going to text you, or there's no conversation going on. Man, I I hate, me and my wife laugh at people all the time. I guess we're old school. When we go on, like, we go on a date somewhere, we'll see these younger couples, they'll just sit there and they'll start eating, and they're texting each other, sitting across the table from each other. Wow. And I go, you know, this is really stupid. Like, just say what you got to say, learn how to communicate with your words. I think if we would do more of like putting this to the side mm-hmm. and technology in general, in some aspects, I think mm-hmm. we'd do a lot better in this society because I think sometimes we don't realize it where we get hung up in these more than we actually do conversating with people. Cause we don't know how to relate anymore. We don't, we don't want to talk about our feelings anymore. One-on-one we get behind a keyboard right. and think you can just say whatever you want to. And it shouldn't have to be that way. Like yeah. You should be able to say what you want to, Without everybody getting offended or anything like that. Well, you're talking about texting each other. There's no personal conversation. Zero. There's no deep connection. There's so you have zero. a lot of surface level connections, mm-hmm. and we look at anxiety, depression, all mm-hmm. that. I think it's a lot of that's related. Yeah, related to relationships and the yep. lack of. Because there's so many apps now that right. you can get on and just talk to whoever you want to. And it's like, I, I never, when I was dating or whatever you want to call it, there was no like, I didn't text much. Texting just ain't my thing. I'd rather call you on the phone and talk to you. I want to get to actually know you as a person. And you can tell a lot about it, people, when you're sitting there and you're talking to them, how they react to certain things that you couldn't through a text message. That's right. Text message has no meaning behind it. You can't tell if somebody's upset through a text or how they're going to react through a text. Right. You may take it totally opposite of what they actually are wanting to actually, you know, how they feel. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't. Today's day and age of people dating, I think you're going to see less and less marriage because of all this, the apps that they can go through and everything they can hide and everything else. Mm-hmm. I just think there's going to be a lot more issues. In the or future. more short term marriages. Short term marriages. We've seen the divorce yeah, rates. 100%. Uh, yeah. 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 But the deep connection isn't there. It's like you said, yeah, there's none. They're across the table and they're texting versus talking. It's just yeah. kind of almost uh, foreign. Well, you know, you go to like, let's just say you go to one of your family's Christmases or something. Look how many people you can have a game going on or something. Let's just say you got a game going on. Look how many people are sitting in the room that are not talking that are on their phone. Mm-hmm. It's everybody. Yeah. You know, and so, and you know, when we all get together with my family, we try just to hang out, mm-hmm. shoot the bull. We love to talk though. So yeah. it's just one of those things we love to talk. So it's a little bit easier for us. Sure. But you know, and some families don't and there's no connection there. There's no communication. And, and I think that's, that's not a good thing. Mm-hmm. That's, it's really not. So how do you do that? You know, in raising a family, have you set kind of a standard job time where phones go away? How do you manage that being a parent? You know, not really. She don't. She stays on her phone not a, not as much as I would think that she does. But usually, if she's on the phone, she's not really. She Snapchats and stuff. We monitor all that. Mm-hmm. Um, but she FaceTimes her friends and they talk and they do stuff on the phone, like crafts and stuff, or they do makeup tutorials with each other. It's you just these kids are goofy oh yeah <laughs> but you know we monitor everything that she does on it uh we have all of her passcodes we have everything on her phone um so it, it's she stays on a little bit more than i would like mm-hmm. 
Uh, but really, she's it don't consume her like it does some kids. Yeah, uh, I give her a I've hard time it, about it, but I've it, seen it. It really don't consume her that much. I mean, she still goes because my grand her grandparents live, her uh, my wife's parents live down the hill from us on mm-hmm. the property, and they live I don't know four or five hundred yards away from us, and so. She'll drive my truck down there through the pasture and she'll just go in there, hang out with them. She's not on her phone. She's hanging out with her grandparents, having a good time. You know, she's old school in some ways. I mean, she <laughs> still likes the one-on-one talking. She's still, you know, because I tell her we, we still eat dinner, uh, which is some people probably do whatever they want to for dinner, but we try to every night, uh, that we're at the house, mm-hmm. even if we get something to bring home, we eat at the dinner table mm-hmm. together and the TV. Yeah. We got the TV on, but like we actually communicate and we sit there and we actually talk. Do you think that that's impacted your child to be less into their phone? Uh, yeah, because we don't do phones at the table while yeah. we're eating. We actually talk and see how everybody's day went, see what's going on. Uh, sometimes when she's wanting to talk about middle school drama, it's just like, I want to pull my hair out. But, <laughs> but also in the same breath, I don't want her to feel like she can't come to me about this. Yes. So, Sometimes I'm like, hey, all right, look, that's enough. I don't need to hear all that talk to you, to you about your mama. Because sometimes it, I'm like, I don't want to hear that type of thing. Like, is in like too much girl stuff going on? Like, no, I can hear some, but I, some of them I'm like, no, you're still a little girl. Like, I don't need to hear this. Right. Uh, but no, she, she's a really good kid. I, I've, we butt heads a good bit sometimes just because we're so much. You would not think that she was not mine. Mm-hmm. If you was to sit in a room with us, see how she is, you would not think that. Well, you uh, said something I want to kind of uh, expand on kids being able to come to their parents and feeling comfortable doing that. 100%. I think that's a big deal. I don't think a lot of kids, no. I mean, kids hide stuff from their parents all the time because they're not comfortable. Absolutely. Um, how have you kind of set that standard? We've told her since she was little, uh, you can come to us about anything. No matter what it is, how big the situation is, don't feel like you can't come to us. Mm-hmm. Now, we still may not want to actually hear it, but we will listen. Sure. And so we've gave her, you know, some leeway on that, um, which she's not going to tell us everything. And sometimes we know something's bothering her and she will tell us in a few days. Um, but we, we try not to push either when she's ready to say something, she will, right. uh, if something's really bothering her, she does not hold back. She lets everybody know, mm. uh, which is a good thing. And she does it in a respectful way because I told her, I said, look, if you start off being disrespectful, I'm not going to hear it. Yeah. So let's, let's talk like adults. Yes. Um, cause I mean, she's 14. So she and going on 15. So it's not like she's some little three year old kid that, you know, don't know what, to, how to express themselves. Mm. So she expresses herself pretty well. Um, and she communicates good. So that's key. The communication part's key with that. Mm-hmm. So that's good, man. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, uh, being a stepfather and all that, that's an awesome thing. Um, so girl, dad, that was a hashtag thing. How do you feel about uh, having a, you've kind of explained on it already, but kind of talk about being a girl dad um, and being a step parent overall. Cause you did mention like, this was not in the plan. Yeah. God not a different plan, plan at, all. at all. So, so how's it been overall, man? Uh, a plus. Yeah. I mean, like I, I love it. Don't, mm-hmm. I mean, there are some days I'm like, Oh my God, this is too much girl stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm outnumbered with my animals too. I got a lot more female animals and I got two males and well, I got three males, really. I got a goat that's a male, too. But uh, yeah, we're just outnumbered. Well, I've time. talked to people about they have kids and then they have stepchildren, kind of notice the difference. But you've only had a, a stepchild, yeah. so you don't really know the difference, really. No. So, mm. you know, I, I love her like she's mine. I trade her like she's mine. I discipline her like she's mine. Sure. Uh, and I told her, don't expect any less if me and mom decide to have a child. Uh, so, you know, I'm not going to – I don't play favorites. That's not how I was raised. Mm. Um, but being a step parent and being a girl dad, uh, being a girl dad scares the holy hell out of me. <laughs> I'm just gonna be honest with you. Yeah. Um, I think it's because I know how guys are. Um, not every guy. Yeah. So I, I know a lot of tricks of the trade. Yeah. Like I'm not an idiot from experience. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're not going to elaborate on none of no, that. No, no, sir. Uh, I was never a bad guy. I just sure. like to have too much fun when sure. I probably really shouldn't have. Um, We've all been kids before. So. <laughs> yeah. And I think I look at it as in, and I tell her this all the time, do not date a guy 
that was like me in my early teens and my early twenties. Don't like, I I don't want that for you. Mm -hmm. And and I think me going through what I went through doing all that opened up my eyes a little bit. Like "Eh, that was somebody's daughter. You know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like, not that I disrespected them as in like, you know, broke their heart or was just a jerk to them or anything. But, um, just treating them like they were just, I shouldn't say nothing. I shouldn't mm. say it that way, but you know what I'm saying? Like friends with benefits, basically. Right. I didn't want a relationship. Right. And I, and, and like I tell her all the time, like you're worth way more than that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so treat yourself that way. If the man, if the guy or boy, whatever, if that's the only thing they want, show them the door mm-hmm. because you're worth more than that. Yeah. And I, and I think me going, doing everything that I did at a young age to now, it's opened my eyes a little bit like, hey, look, maybe I shouldn't have went about it that way. But you can't change the past, obviously. Well, you learn from mistakes. Everybody, 100%. Everybody makes them. And so, like, when one of them little boys comes up and tries to flirt, and I'm like, mm, not happening. Yeah. Like, I, I know your intentions. I'll see it right now. Ain't happening. Like, good kid, but no, uh-uh. Yeah. No. So, it, it's, um, it can be stressful. Uh, and she, Obviously, she has little boys that talk to her and stuff, and I, and I know that's going to happen, so. Well, how do you feel about the thought that some people, and I've heard parents say this about their teenage boys or whatever, they got to get it out of their system. You know, uh, do you think everybody needs that? Some people get into like be a player at 30, 40, whatever. That happens too. You know, it does. Uh, do you feel like having that experience as a young age, looking at it negatively, like, okay, I need to kind of grow up here and get out of that? Do you feel like that was important for you? Yeah, I, I got to a point where I'll just become numb to it. Like it was nothing. Right. Um, and I was raised great. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that wasn't my issue. My issue was just females in general. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah. I, I think it's just one of those things. Guys are going to be guys, right? Sure. But I think that's a saying that guys just made up. Guys are going to be guys. We're going to do this, this, that. No, I mean, we have, any, we have a choice just like everybody else. Excuses bad behavior. Absolutely. Right. And so... If I had to go back to tell my younger self, I would have had more respect for myself. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't have done the things that I did. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's made me who I am today of kind of having to see what I've known, what I've went through and what, what has happened and everything else. So there, there's two sides to it. Well, experience is the best teacher. You know? And because you went through that, now you can see that raising a daughter. You know, yep. like you said, that wasn't really in the plan, but maybe mm-hmm. through life experience, now you can race her well. Hundred percent. You know, because you've seen a lot of stuff and all that. Yeah. So that's awesome stuff, man. Um, so the gym. Let's talk about that a little bit. Are you <laughs> are you still into fitness, any? No. Um. So no. Um. No. I, no. Period. <laughs> well, my wife has been on me the last couple of weeks. So yeah, the last couple of weeks I've been trying to exercise some, um, which. I do need to get back into shape. Sure. So to elaborate a little bit, we we went to the gym uh, when we were 16, 17, 18, all that. Uh, and you were in 20s. Yeah, you were football. Yep. Right. Football so and baseball. That's kind of what got you into fitness. What was your fitness journey like? Oh, it was great. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, when I was out of high school, went to college, and then after that, and then worked out in my 20s, you know, 20, when I got to about 24, and then I just, I really just stopped. Yeah. Life took over. Me being a dad took over. Uh, career took a different path, and it was just, you know, I think that kind of got me out of the rhythm of going because I was going four or five days a week, mm-hmm. pretty good shape, uh, strongest I've ever been in my life. Yeah, um, and I've still got it. It's just the consistency's my problem. Mm-hmm. I may be able to go one day that week and then none, but I make excuses. Mm-hmm. So my wife's been trying to push me to get out of the excuse making because I get her point where you can go make time to go play softball, but you all not, but you won't make time to go work out for 30, 45 minutes. Right. And so I'm like, okay, you're right again. So <laughs> it's just one of those things I've got to turn back and go, all right, let's do this. Yeah. Cause it wouldn't take me much really to get back into shape because like I said, I play a decent amount of softball where I'm running around playing and doing all that stuff. So that aspect of it's not bad. It's just the actual working out of it. So we're in our, we're in our 30s. Yep. Uh, people that kind of were like you in their 20s, and then they kind of they yep. fell off getting back on it. 
What would you say to those people? How do you do it? Um, I know consistency. Really consistency is, is really it. just the, the mindset of saying, hey, look, I'm going to set aside 30, 45 minutes a day. Mm-hmm. It don't matter if it's walking. I, I What I'm trying to do is I want to lift weights. I want to get my body back to what yeah. I had it. And it wouldn't take me long because I did it for a brief amount of time a few years ago for a couple of months. And I started getting everything back. And then I lost it again because work got involved and everything. It's just like, good gosh, it just couldn't catch a break. Well, now I'm like, okay, I've I've got work down to a certain point to where I've got so many hours in between to where I've got to start cooking supper or helping my wife with supper. And so if I could just take 30 to 45 minutes, it's huge for me. Mm-hmm. So that that's um getting back into it and just doing it is the hardest part. Mm-hmm. Usually, you know, they say if you've been if you do it consistently for a month, you'll keep doing it. Yeah. And so I've got to get to that point. Yeah. Well, um, it's just doing it for sure. Cause yeah, the want to and all that. And there's a lot more obstacles now, oh, obviously yeah. versus teens and twenties to get in there. Well, you know, for the most part, I still feel like a kid. Yeah. I still get up, I run around, I play, I dive, I slide. Like I don't, I don't hurt. Now yeah. if I play, we'll play like Friday night, one pitch tournaments. Okay. I'm, I'm a little stiff the next morning because you're playing eight or nine ball games in a night. Mm-hmm. You'll start at seven o'clock at night, may get home at four or five o'clock in the morning. So you've been up for, you know, at least 24 hours Mm -hmm. and then it's on a Friday night. So on Saturdays, obviously now it's football season. I get two or three hours of sleep Mm -hmm. and I watch football the rest of the day. So it's one of those things like, like she said, I can make time to do those things. That's right. You know, but I don't want to make time to work out. Yeah. It's just discipline, man, for sure. Uh, Steroids. Can we get it? Go for it. Yeah. So talk about that. I, we had a lot of guys working out with us. Good that, Lord. Yes. That, were on, that were on it. Okay. Yeah, and a lot of them, I'd ask them, I've said this before in the podcast, but I'd say, how do you get, how, I want to be like, how do I get like that? And they're like, well, you got to eat your tuna. You got to yeah. have the rice and be consistent. Yeah. And really they were using drugs and all that. What now, you know, there's a lot of people in their bio. They're like, here's what I take. They just tell people like, yeah. I take this and all that. What do you think about uh gear in general? I think it comes to a certain time in a man's life where he may have to take some testosterone. Sure. You know, that, especially in your 40s, 30s too, really, in some men, 100%. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think there's people that are ashamed that they have to do that because they're in their 30s, you know. But it's really not that big of a deal anymore. Uh, the people that take, I'm not knocking them. If you, this is the thing. If you're taking steroids, people think, oh, you're taking steroids and it's just magically going to happen for you. You still got to put in the work. That's right. That's right. You still got to hammer it out. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just like the same thing with all these guys talking about people taking steroids in baseball. Okay, yeah, hundred percent. But that steroid didn't make him hit that ball. That's right. He still has to have the hand-eye coordination, and it does help with things. I do hundred percent agree with it. But I just um, steroids. Eh, never took them. Never wanted to. Yeah. I I was blessed to be naturally strong. Yeah. Uh, I didn't have to take anything. I never wanted to. Mm-hmm. Um, would it have been fun if it don't hurt your body in the long run or hurt you in general just to try it for a month or two? Absolutely. Just to see what you could do. Yeah. Yeah. I well, mean, that's what I've always thought about, too. At times, people are like, what are you taking? And they, yeah. they think it's like, I'm like I don't take any. No. I don't do all that. No. Never done it. You know, never I just don't. To. Yeah. But to do that, uh, to see what it would do, that would be pretty cool, I would say. Yeah, I but mean, the, the risk is just not worth it. To it's me. not worth it, man. It, it's it's yeah. truly not. It's hard on your kidneys, and yeah. your liver, <clears throat> yeah. Um, and those two things you really need to to live. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> well, your heart too it messes yeah. with lipid levels, messes with it messes a lot with of a stuff, whole from my, bunch of stuff. Yeah. yeah, it's just not worth it to me. Yeah, but you know, there are people that do it and do it for a long, long, long time. Yeah, and uh, and that's fine. To each his own. It's your life. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, steroids is a no go. Yeah, I agree. It was just the way I think a lot of people presented it back then. Like, oh, you you you're not working hard enough. Yeah, you know. And then they're they're in there taking that. It's kind of lame, but yeah. But that was really about it. But uh, yeah, never done it myself. But to me, I look at the financial or some kind of gain. Like, what yeah. am I going to get from it? Uh, for well, me, that was vanity, my whole thing. vanity to me just isn't worth messing up my body long term and all that. That, mm-hmm. but to some people, it is. It's worth it. Yeah, some people have a self image problem. Yeah, that's true. They want to look a certain type of way, and that's fine. If you want to put in the work to look a certain type of way and you have to take steroids to get there, okay, but you've got to realize you're going to get to some certain point in your life to where you will not be able to take those steroids anymore. Yeah. What are you going to look like after that? 
Mm-hmm. And I just never thought it was important enough to me to be like, hey, look, I've got a six pack without even flexing. Don't really care. Yeah. That's not going to pay your bills. Right. That's not going to make you a better person. Right. That's not going to make that girl want you anymore. She may for a little bit, but then she's going to move on to some other guy that's got a six pack, looks better than yours if that's right. the case. Right. So I, I never understood that that outlook upon things. I really did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I never have either. I've been the same exact way. Fitness is important. Taking yeah. care of your body is important, but it can be uh, it can become unhealthy. It can for sure, for yeah. sure. So fitness is good, man. Uh, business. You're in the food service business. Let's talk about that, dude. So you you did some stuff before, and then I remember. Uh, a few years back, you posted kind of had a breakthrough with going into this business and all that. Is that right? Yeah. So, so anyway, let's talk about food. You're in the food industry. So yep. talk about everything about it. So food industry, boy, it's it's something. It's been up and down like a roller coaster, especially since COVID. Um, Everything before COVID, COVID. was yeah, COVID. 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 Yeah. Everything before then was it was running pretty smooth. Yeah. Uh, after that, still pretty it's getting back on track. Let's just say it that. Well, I think talk uh, to interrupt intrusive thoughts. Sorry, but COVID it's going to take five, ten years, 100%. I think, to get back to normal. And we've seen the the after effects of that. Well, yeah. And if we don't, well, I'm not going to get political, right? We can a little bit. I don't, I don't uh, follow. Either. No, I'm not going to do <laughs> it. Not going to do it. All right, uh-uh. all right. We'll stay. We'll keep it safe. It's all good. Let's just say, Papa, I don't need to be there. Yeah. So, well, we want a strong leader. That's all I'm going to say. Well, uh, America needs strength. That's all of them. Yeah, he ain't got it. Yeah. Vice president's got more balls than he does. <laughs> okay. And that's a problem. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so anyway, food industry, how is it? It's good, man. I love my job. Mm-hmm. Um, I cover six or seven counties. Um, I do restaurants. I don't do any hospitals, but we do hospitals as a company, but I don't have any. Uh, I have a sister living in a nursing home business. Um. You know that, and that's that's great business. So uh, do you do the food industry for those? Is that what I you're do? Saying? All so so I don't just sell food. Um, I sell everything that goes into restaurants. Okay, I'll even sell the hood uh, hood vents. I sell everything that goes in the kitchen, ovens, fryers, smokers. I sell it all. I sell all your paper products. I sell all your chemicals, dish machines. We sell everything. Um, we've got different companies we've partnered with that we have that handle that for us but mm-hmm. it is through wood Fertiker. okay uh so yeah man i i love my job i actually talk for a living basically as you could say yeah uh i mean i just sit there and talk to my customers man they're like my friends so i can sit there and talk to them we do life together you know i mean you know we talk about that sometimes some of my customers just call me to shoot the crap and, and i enjoy that and i and i want to have that relationship with them because honestly you know i shouldn't say they pay my bills but they do. I mean, me selling them food, they pay for it. Sure. Gives me gives me money. Sure. So I, I try to do right by my customers. I'm not perfect. Some of your some of my customers will probably say that too. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not perfect. I mess up. But I try to do by, right by my customers too by fixing the issue or the problem that goes on with that. Well, I think any form of business, if you build relationships first and start with that, you're gonna have a fruitful business. Yeah. Really. Oh, absolutely, man. I I've been so blessed, especially through two thousand when twenty twenty happened. And everything shut down. My customers kept me afloat as in um, they started thinking outside the box for food. How, how do they need to keep their business alive? And, uh, man, I without them, I wouldn't have made it. Well, obviously my wife and stuff too, but as in money-wise, no. There's, there was no way. Right. And they got really smart and intelligent. And some of them actually was doing more business than they was previously. Wow. And so I don't think I lost a customer through that. Uh, Everybody stayed open. You know, the first week it wasn't. Everybody just freaked out. And I understood that totally. And, uh, but man, after that, they just, I think my customer, I've got a lot of old school customers. Mm -hmm. And so they're like, no, we're going to make money. This is how we do it. And so they, they just buckled it up. Mm-hmm. And they just went after it 100%. They're going to like, you know, sink or swim. So you talked about COVID. Hopefully we don't get canceled by saying COVID. But uh, I'm going to say it again. But uh, talk about that. What You talked about what you did. What did you do? What? How did you get through those struggles to adapt and all that? So at the time, luckily, 
you know, I can do everything from my house Mm -hmm. if need be. And what does he do exactly? I just take their orders. And I know that sounds like it's simple, but it's really not. No, yeah. Um, You know, I get paid for some of my knowledge that I actually know on food that I know like, hey, this would be good with this or like, Oh, it's simple. Like, hey, look at a cup. People are like, it's just a cup. Well, it's not just a cup. Right. That cup goes with this lid. This goes with that lid. Like, this is this. There's so many different moving parts in the food industry of it. Like, everybody goes, only thing you're doing is taking your order. Not that simple. Right. I've got to make sure I'm also collecting on their payments. I got to make sure that I'm keeping up with trucks. I got to make sure they're getting the trucks when they're supposed to be getting their trucks. I got to make sure that everything's getting on the truck. So I'm having to do checks on checks on checks on checks on checks for each customer throughout the day. Mm-hmm. And people's like, well, that's not that big of a deal. Well, it is when you got 60 something customers through the week. Right. And they expect you to know when, hey, I say this, this is exactly what I mean. Because everybody's got different lingos when they say stuff. Sure. Now I've known my customers for a while now, so it makes everything a lot easier. But, you know, getting through everything that we did in 2020, they adapted. Mm-hmm. And that was the biggest thing for me. And some of them have still keep, um, some of them have just still been drive through. They just do drive through or just mm-hmm. walk up. And that's pretty, it's pretty neat. It keeps their labor costs down because they're not having to pay as many people to work the dining room or anything. So mm-hmm. it, it's a, it's a neat thing that, um, I would have never thought that we would have made it through it. Just to be honest with you. I, mm-hmm. I, I really thought there for a minute, I went, here we go. Um, but I think everybody as Americans was like, all right, <laughs> keeping us home this long is not going to happen. Right. And I, and I started seeing more and more stuff happen for the good uh, when everybody started getting out money wise, especially because people were buying not just, hey, I'm going to spend $10, bro. They were spending money. Mm-hmm. And it was showing like I had some, I got some meat, meat places that I sell food to as well. And they're like, hey, I, I, do you have any deals on anything? Because with us staying stationary, schools closing down and all that, we had stuff that we were supposed to be selling to schools. We couldn't sell anymore. Right. And so I had some places like, hey, uh, you got this product? And I'm like, yeah. How many cases you got? And I'm like, I don't know, three or 400. Give me all of them. And I'm like, what? Hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. You want me to go load the truck up for you? I yeah. mean, like, that's what I was thinking, which obviously I didn't go load the truck. I mm-hmm. did for one customer, but. Um, you know, there were certain things out there that helped us make money. Mm. You had to, as a salesman, say, okay, I'm a commission salesman. Man, I've got to think outside the box. Mm. To get my family through this, I've got to think outside the box. And so, man, I started selling stuff that I didn't even sell before just to get it out there. Mm. I was selling chemicals, any type of paper, any type of food. If somebody wanted it, if you're a grocery store, I was selling it. Mm. Bring it on. Mm-hmm. I was like, I was selling stuff that I'd never sold to grocery stores. People were like, I heard you got this. Can you get it for me? Yeah. Here's, I'll send you an application. Send it right back to me. I'll get you hooked up, get it to you tomorrow. And we're not talking about, hey, here's a $500 order. We're talking five, six, $10,000 orders. And it's like, wow, like we're going to make it through this. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we started seeing a turn about, I guess you could say six months in, everybody started kind of getting back to not normal. Because you had to wear a mask and all this other crap yeah. that I never wore. Yeah. Uh, but, um, yeah, you, you had to. It made you uncomfortable in a good way. It made you critically think. You had to really it get literally good. made you go, OK, what am I going to do today differently than I did the day before to make money? And I was like, OK, I can do this. So I had to wake up every day with a different mindset. OK, what am I going to do today? To be able to make it to this. And so, I mean, you kind of had to set your own, your own little goals. As I say, I set goals for myself without telling anybody because I don't want nobody telling me putting doubt in my head. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Yeah. I'm like, no, I don't need that. So I never tell anybody my goals really. That's I like right. to hit them silently. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. It is. Uh, because I don't want somebody putting doubt in my head. Well, nobody's going to be excited about the your goals more than you are that's 100 percent true and i think that's a big thing if you can mm-hmm. talk to somebody too and they'll kind of deflate you like i have this new idea i'm gonna do this and they're like well is that really neat and it might be something that really takes off but they don't understand that you have a vision all they're, this stuff they don't understand the long-term goal there no they don't and, mm-hmm. and then there is there's been goals that i've set in my life 
And I've been thankful to hit all those goals that I've wanted before I was right when, basically right when I was 30. Mm -hmm. That was my goal and I hit them. Um, My last goal was to have a house at 30. I own it. Everything, you know what I'm saying? Like Mm -hmm. me and my wife, like I wanted those goals. Mm -hmm. Um, Even when I was a younger kid, um, you know, to myself, I would say, you know, it'd be great to have a, a wife and a kid and live on a bunch of land and and be able to hunt it mm-hmm. like it was something simple but it was a goal right and i always i've always wanted a house on a hill i always I always wanted to be up so i could see everything and like be, but i also wanted to be away from everybody mm-hmm. i love people don't get me wrong but like when i'm at home i want it to be peaceful i want there to be peace there and um uh i've hit all those goals and so now i've made other goals in my life um, you know, so I married into, uh, my wife's family. They've got a bunch of land and, uh, I get to deer hunt it. Mm-hmm. So now I've got a wife and a kid and I, I live up on a big hill and, you know, I get to out overlook everything and see stuff that some people would love to see the well, views that we get. Well, something I want to say, those without vision perish. That's a, uh, uh, from the Bible. Yeah. And uh, and it's a very true thing. Dave Ramsey, I don't know if you're familiar. Yeah, he he quotes that a lot. Yeah. But having goals is is paramount. If you don't have a target, something you're going toward, you're kind of going to wander and not really. You yeah. may end up somewhere good, but I think the likelihood of doing that is very low. So Auburn football. Uh, let's go ahead and dive into that a little bit. That's all I have to say, right? <clears throat> I said uh, I said to another guy on the podcast, I said, uh, his name was Bo. And I said, like, Bo Jackson. And then, like, Bo. And he said, Nick's. <laughs> But anyways, talk about Auburn, man. What's what's it looking like out there? You're Auburn, right? God. <laughs> it's always having a good podcast. Yeah, it's been good so far. <laughs> Just ruined it. Um, God, dude, it's rough. Yeah, but I, I will say this: I think Freeze is going to be able to recruit obviously better. I think Cadillac last year actually saved our recruiting in some aspects. I think he actually showed people, hey, we can still do this at Auburn. There's still life down there at Auburn. There's still family, and it value, it's values down there, man. I, I love Auburn. And, um, you know, watching what they went through last year and how they finished the year off, I know we didn't go to a bowl game. I really didn't care. I wanted them to finish the season as don't quit because – when you have an interim head coach that that man's never quit anything in his life Mm -hmm. and he basically spoke life into these kids that was huge for Auburn football um I mean man you even had Alabama fans being like man I I hope Carnell does great Mm -hmm. like he just I mean he he is what we need at Auburn and I think that's why you're starting to see uh especially recruiting go up I don't know all the details, obviously, with all what they do. Um, but I, I think Auburn's on a trajectory, and everybody's probably like, how can you say that? You've won one SEC game this year. I, I know all the statistics, everybody. Trust me. Right. If anybody does, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, offense looked totally different against Mississippi State. Uh, we did a more of a fast-paced offense, RPOs. Uh, the first half, uh, Peyton Thorne, I think he threw over 200 yards in the first half. He didn't eclipse 200 yards all season. I said, I think against UMass. Mm. So, um, I think if we could do that again or replicate it in some aspects, I think it would be huge. Um, I still think we got to have Robbie in there on some packages just because of his athleticism. Uh, but, but I think Auburn's going to be okay. I, I, this is not a quick fix. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess you could say it could be a quick fix with the transfer portal and stuff going on, mm. but it's really. I think he's wanting to get players in there that want to be at Auburn. And everybody's going to be like, why would you want to be? Well, Auburn's got a pretty cool campus and stuff going on down there right now. Yeah. Uh, Especially huge with NIL money and everything else. So money talks a little bit, obviously. Sure. But uh, I think Auburn's going to be on a trajectory next year. I expect a little bit more. Hey, the season's not over with. Yeah. We've got three winnable games coming up. We got Vandy, Arkansas, and New Mexico State. Yeah. Uh, which will obviously make a seven and four, and then we have the Bama game. Um, well, I will say this: there's been times Auburn has done terrible, and they've beat Alabama when Alabama was good, and that's you know, happened. We we um, you can basically throw away the 
stats when they play each other. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, a lot of these kids know each other, played against each other, or something like that, at least. Mm-hmm. Especially the in-state in kids. Sure. You That's know? true. I never really thought about that. Uh, they've true. played each other in some, some ways. Some of them have. Some of them haven't. Right. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how we do this year at Auburn. Mm-hmm. Uh, with you know, first year head coach Hugh Freeze. I mean, down at the Plains, I, stuff happens down there that it don't happen in other places. I mean, look, we had Georgia on the ropes. Yeah, uh, we forgot that they have a tight end that's insane. Yeah, he's like Gronkowski. Yeah, he is. And we decided we didn't want to cover him. No big deal. Just leave the big guy. You know, I can understand if it was their other little white receiver. That he's about this tall. Like he gets you is know, he it McConkey? Yeah, yeah. This guy's 6'5", 250, yeah. <laughs> running across the field in front of you. Like, yeah. Do you not see him wide open? I remember that one. That I don't there. hit him. I don't care if he's got the ball. Just hit him. Yeah. I'll take a 15-yard penalty before he scores a touchdown all day. Mm-hmm. I mean, I got tired of seeing that. And they didn't open it up to the second half. You know, and that's when they really started hammering us away, and we could not stop it. Mm-hmm. And our offense was stagnant anyway. Um but I think we may have figured something out this past weekend. I know it was Mississippi State, and everybody's going to be like, well, they're not that good. Well, they had a better record than we did. Well, I will say this. You know, Hugh Freeze, he's there as new coach of Auburn. If him, People listen all over the U.S. on this thing. Yeah. Uh, located in Alabama, Alabama-Auburn, that's kind of what we're talking about. But Auburn's head coach, uh, you know, Nick Saban, when he lost to UL Monroe. Oh, first year, 100%. Right. So it, there, it takes some adjusting, it getting is. those recruits in and all that. Like you said, recruiting's booming. Year up. two, take time. Saban turned it around. Yeah. Uh, but really, it was year three when it all came together. Oh, nine. Yeah. I mean, because they, they, I think he's seen that he needed a couple more pieces when they played Florida in the SEC championship. Right. And it was at 08, and they lost. Right. I think he thought, okay, we can do this. And ever since then, they've been on a trajectory of just up. Yeah. Well, that's kind of one I want to segue into the Saban era. I think the defense. Ever ever since Saban's been there, the defense yeah. has been insanely good. I would say in the 2010s, that's when it was it, it, untouchable. I mean, yeah. really, that you couldn't run against them anything. Now I feel like it's starting to slack off. You've seen a lot of uh, a lot of changes. I think it has to do with NIL. I think so too. Do you think I'll ask you two questions that that was to stop the SEC and bring other schools in there? Because other Texas, you got USC, all these big schools can pay them and. Is the Nick Saban dynasty over? So, I think NIL, they were trying to level the playing field because they got tired of the SEC period winning. Yes. Yeah. And the SEC, and everybody goes, well, y'all just have football. Eh, no, baseball. I mean, yes, you have some other schools that win in, obviously, in baseball. Softball. Well, basketball. Women's basketball. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we got women's basketball. <laughs> uh, it, you got softball. Mm-hmm. And everybody goes, well, it's Oklahoma. Well, Oklahoma's in the SEC next year, guys. That's true. So the money thing is huge. And you got more money down here. It's not that you have more money down here. We don't have any pro teams. This mm-hmm. is our pro teams. Right. Alabama, Auburn are our pro teams. So we put all of our money into them. That's a good point. And so I think it means more to us college football. I think college football in the South means more than anywhere else in the country. Because go go to go to a football game on Friday nights. I mean, most of the time you got a pretty good crowd there. It don't matter where you go. High school, you're talking about. Yeah, high school in general. Yeah, yeah. and even the small colleges around here, Mm -hmm. people love going to games. JSU, JSU, JSU's great. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love JSU, Mm -hmm. and so I think everybody was raised up. I would say, especially around Edwall County where we live. Uh, you know, you play sports. I mean, I, I think that's key. Yeah, especially football. Yeah. Especially football. So you think the NIL was uh, created to kind of take down the SEC? Maybe. I think I think were, it was a component for sure. I think there was some aspects of it. I think it's really killed college football. Well, there's no regulation, and I think yeah. that's where um Miss Ole Miss um Lane Kiffin yeah. talked about that. It's cool. I mean, because they get a trillion dollars. Like, the NCAA, I mean, yeah, yeah, you can't pay them. Hey, man, and then you're they're 19 years in. old. Listen, let me say this. If I would have been 18, 19 years old, let's just say I was good enough to play and I was like loaded, five, I was a big time five star recruit, and you're going to be like, hey, man, I'm going to pay you about a million and a half, two million. Mm-hmm. 
that would probably be going to child support. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest with you. Yeah. They're not out there spending that money wisely. Right. Sure. They're going crazy with it. Yeah. You cannot give. I don't care what background they come from. You cannot give somebody that much money. Mm-hmm. You can't. You cannot say, hey, we're going to pay you this much money this year. I don't care if it's all at once or it's in a little supplement. $1.5 million, I don't care if you're getting paid once a month. Is still over a hundred and something thousand dollars a month. Kid. Yeah, that's a lot of money for kids that literally have everything already paid for. Well, the maturity isn't there. You can't drink till you're 21. You but know, that's and, the whole but thing. Yeah, you're going to give 18, 19 year olds millions of dollars. That's not not really practical. They're out there buying <laughs> who knows what vehicles and yeah, everything else in between. Yeah. Yeah, but it is different, and the lack of regulation. I think the kids need to make money. I, I don't. I don't think they should. I don't have a problem with that uh, because the NCAA gets so much. I mean, how can we not pay them anything at all? But there needs to be some kind of regulation rules. Well, all that. let me ask you this: If you're a scholarship athlete, you know, if you're four, let's just say you're football, just in general, your food, everything's taken care of. You're, from what I understand, I don't know about the housing and some of it, but. A lot of your stuff is taken care of. Um, your travel, mm-hmm. all the clothes that you wear, taken care of. Mm-hmm. Everybody looks the same. Everybody dresses the same. Um, you know, some of these kids don't realize they're getting an education worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right. Not including all what all they're having to pay for travel. Mm-hmm. Traveling across the country, especially Alabama. I mean, how many national championships have they been to? Yeah. Especially in the last decade. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah, I I think they need to get paid. If you were to pay college football players, let's just say everybody gets fifty thousand dollars a year, they can live off of that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because but everything else, really everything else is of. paid for. Right. Housing on that. They don't have to drive a hundred thousand dollar Mercedes. Mm-hmm. I, I I just don't get it. Yeah. Would I love that back in the day? I mean, maybe. I mean, that'd been great. Mm-hmm. But they don't. Uh. There needs to be there needs to be regulations, hundred percent. Yeah, it's good. There just needs to be regulations for sure. So to answer the question, this too is the Saban dynasty over. Do you think it'll continue? Co- go back to what it was? Because I feel like it's not what it, it will never even, be. What even it Bryce was. Young when he was there, like they couldn't get the natty and all that, but they got the you know well, a horrible defensive coordinator. Yeah, he was yeah. trash. He's an old Miss, obviously. Yeah, he's not that great. <laughs> he's not aggressive enough, I don't think, for Saban. Uh, I think Kevin. St- I've always really liked Kevin Steele. I think he's aggressive enough. Defense is pretty solid this year. Mm-hmm. Um, Texas game was, it is what it is. Yeah, uh, they've played a lot better since the Texas game. Mm-hmm. Um, well, they're so young. I mean, they had the they're youngest, young. Yeah, but I do think that. Uh, I don't think the saving era is over. I would love for it to be. Obviously, <laughs> I just don't. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Everybody goes. Well, they already lost one this year. Yeah, they're probably going to lose again. Yeah, and I think it so. could be this Saturday. Yeah, uh, offensively is the problem this year, I believe. Now, now that some people may say hey, I'm an idiot and I don't know what I'm talking about, well, that's fine. Uh, offensive line is the problem. Mm-hmm. You get too much push, way too much push. I mean, what are the? I don't know how many sacks they're giving up a game, but it's probably four or five, three or four at least. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so. And you got Jalen Miller about that can move. He can. I mean, that's the move. thing. Well, I think he holds on the ball sometimes. Too he does. Long. He does. But I don't think his receivers are open either. Yeah. If Burton, if you shut down Burton, it could be talking about a different football game. That's true. Um, and they're gonna find out this weekend what they're made. LSU's defense has changed changed some stuff around since even when they played uh when they played Missouri they started changing stuff in that second half, mm. and I think they stuck with it especially against us which we're not great offensively. Don't get me wrong, but. If Alabama starts out the way they did against Tennessee, I think the game's over before half. Yeah. Because uh, the quarterback for LSU, Daniels, he, he is not uh, going to settle for a field goal. Right. Uh, and I think he'll get it done with his feet or his arm to be able to score a touchdown. And they've got really good receivers this year. I agree. So it, I'm not going to say Alabama's going to lose. I'm not going to say that. But I do think that it's going to be one of those things – if they play like they did against Tennessee in the first half, it will be done. Well, this so, comes out in a month. Well, I'm like a month ahead on the podcast episodes. So go ahead and give us a prediction. Alabama, LSU, what do you got? What's the score? What's the spread? Dang. <laughs> Let's see if I'll, I'll predict it. Uh, LSU 31, Bama 27. Wow. 
Oh, man. Uh, and it could go either way. It really can. Because but LSU. I'm going to say 34 27 Alabama. 34 27 Alabama. I, I could say it either way. Mm-hmm. I, could, I could say Alabama's defense uh, making a play. Mm-hmm. I mean, you got Brandt because they man. have. Yeah, yeah, they've been making plays this year like they didn't last year. They're more aggressive on the run. That's true. Um, th- they're a little suspect on the pass, but for the most part, they're pretty solid. Mm. Uh, on, on the run, I think you're going to have to pass it to beat them. Well, going back to what you said about Alabama offensive line, uh, Mark Ingram, Trent Richardson, Eddie Lacy, they had that dominant offensive line, and that's what you're missing now. Yeah, and, and that's been the issue. For I sure. think y'all got to kill a running back. Yeah. He just don't have the line to run behind. Yes. Um. I, like I said, I think it could go either way, but I, I've got LSU in this, and that's not me being an Alabama hater. Yeah. I'm just looking at nobody has stopped George, uh, LSU's offense. Mm-mm. Everybody goes, well, Florida State did. Y- yes and no. They had like 500 yards against Florida State. Yeah. It was one of those things. LSU's defense was just didn't show up in the second half, mm-hmm. and that could happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know. It seems like to me Alabama's a second half team this year. Yeah. Uh they're not putting people away in the first half. Um, uh, which could come back to bite them not saying the last game of the regular season, but if you don't put Auburn away in the second in the first half, it could be an interesting football game. Well, I was at the Alabama Tennessee game. I was there sitting there sick, man. I was like I chose the wrong one to come to. And then they came out and just killed it. Miller threw a dot fifty yards, you Dude. know, but he throws mm. a really good deep ball. He does, but that's His intermediate the passes are eh. right. He throws a really good deep. Yeah, ball. it's good. It's good. And Burton actually played really well in the second half. Mm-hmm. He kept him in it. If you throw that ball in his area, he catches it. Now, he does. I don't like him necessarily, but um, he seems like he's a little. I'm not saying that you can't be cocky playing sports, but sometimes. Yeah, he's a little too extra. He is. He's but I get it. I want somebody to play with fire, though. I, yeah. I so I, I'm not going to knock it. We'll compare it like Dennis Rodman, like so theatrical stuff like that. But yeah. that's what made him good. Absolutely. And I it, think, that's I the think they push. do it more for themselves than they actually do it for anybody else. Yeah. Like, take anybody else. But keeps them fired works. up. It still works, though. 100%. I mean, for the team, it works. Yeah, it keeps you fired up, man. It keeps you in the game. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I I just think LSU wins. Mm-hmm. And will I be probably smiling if they do? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I think this Alabama team, I think it's a two loss for sure. I don't know if they'll go. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it could be what LSU. It's gonna be Georgia, uh, LSU Georgia or Alabama Georgia. Is that what we're looking yeah. at? Pretty much for the SEC. Uh, Ole Miss. Okay, yeah, that's right, Ole Miss. There because there's be, six and one. Only seven. lost one. Yeah, and that was to Alabama. Alabama. Yeah, pretty bad loss though, wasn't it? It's twenty seven nine or something like that. Yeah. I think. So, uh, yeah, that could be a. It could be a game. I mean, be. you could. It could go any way. Now. I mean, Alabama still got to go to Kentucky. That's true. Kentucky's Kentucky. strong. Kentucky's, Kentucky's strong. not bad. Every SEC game, man. I mean, it could be any week. Yeah, it's it not really can. We'll see. Well, bad. you never know, man. You could get lucky. Uh, they have before. They I have mean, before. Ask Florida. <clears throat> so <laughs> I'm gonna say roll tide, man. Yeah. Uh, you're not gonna hear me say that <laughs> other word. Uh, okay. Mm, no. uh, okay. Not I right now. I don't like LSU. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, we'll see how it goes. So we're going to kind of segue into this. Um, something that I know about you, um, about your mom. Yeah. So um, for those that don't know, your mom passed away. I was uh, 10. You were 10 years old. We're going to kind yeah. of get into that and all that. And the reason I know that is when I met your dad, yeah. uh, my mom is a nurse, and she actually took care of your mom and all yeah. that for a time period and all that, which is a small world, man. Um, but kind of talk about that. You were 10 years old when she passed. What was that experience like and kind of go into it a little bit? Yeah, man. It was... She died 11 days after my 10-year-old birthday. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was tough. Um, it was tough on a totally different... It's hard to even explain because, like, as a kid, you're not... You don't want to lose your parents early, mm-hmm. obviously. Um, and as a parent, you don't want to lose your kids early. Um, but I... I, it was a struggle. Um, at 10 years old, you kind of have to look at life and go, well, what happened? Mm-hmm. Uh, where did you go from here? Um, and so some kids struggle the rest of their life with it. Yeah. Um, I chose not to. 
I chose that not to define me in a way of as, oh, he's acting out because his mama died. Uh, oh, he did this because his, you know, his mama died. Oh, he's doing this because his mama died. I, I didn't want that. Um, so, and, and I was raised, you know, uh, in a really good home growing up. Mm-hmm. So I think that helped me get through it. And also having... Some of my friends' moms too pick up the slack. My granny, my dad's mom moved up here with my granddaddy. Uh, that helped tremendously. So she, she kind of took the mom role, mm-hmm. uh, and you know she was living with us. My my mom's last year to be alive. She lived with us, um, and she took care of us, and uh, she did that for a while. You know, and then my dad met my stepmother, Lori, and right. she's been my mom now for longer than I've actually had my mom. She's 20 years, 20 years this year Wow! in December. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was tough. Uh, you know, 10 years old, you could take any path you want to, you know, especially with something like that happened. You could have an excuse and blame and hate everybody and be mad at the world. And my mom wouldn't have wanted that. So I chose not to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I still have times a day where it's like, hey, God, I miss my mom. Like, I wish she was here. But in the same breath, it's like, yeah, but if she was here, she'd be in pain. It's not worth it. Yeah. You know, cancer sucks. Um, And so with that, it was one of those things. My mom was my biggest cheerleader when it came into sports. And so that was hard for me to do that year. Mm-hmm. But I went ahead and did it, and I was so thankful that I did. That was the most fun I had. Um. That that next year, even though that she had passed in February, I played that that spring and summer, and man, I had a blast. It, it really kept me going, um, hanging around with the guys and playing and traveling, and kept my mind off a lot of things. You know, you you, I didn't go to school for a while, um, which they brought my work to me and stuff. It it was it was one of the hard. It's the hardest thing I've ever went through in my life. Sure. And, and I look at it now. No matter what happens in my life, and that, it, besides losing a kid, I've already went through the hardest thing I've ever went through mm-hmm. at a young age, mm-hmm. and I kicked its ass. Well, so, I think looking at it from that perspective, you made a choice. 100%. You didn't let it define you, mm-hmm. uh, and you chose to to do that. Um, what would you say to somebody that's that's lost a parent and all that? What would you say to them? Um, you know, people say it gets better with Tom. He just learned how to deal with it. Yeah. Nothing gets better about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but talk about it. Yeah. Don't hold it and talk about it often. Share stories. I don't mind talking about it. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes I get emotional talking about it. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I love that woman and she was the greatest mom you could ask for. And so to talk about her and to keep her memory alive really kind of helps cope with everything right uh and not just shut down so i mean that's key and that i think it's key now it may not be for some other people but you know i think opening up to people about certain things will i say release the stress but release some of that well, vulnerability comes healing. You know, and I think, you know, as guys, that's what we try to do. We try to Dude, push I'm it like all a teddy down bear. And, yeah. I, you know, that's one thing about me. I don't let a lot of people in. Like, as in, if I don't know somebody, like, I'm not going to let them get to know the real me. Mm-hmm. I, my wife always says I'm a big softy. And I am. Like, I, the girls come over. It can be 10 o'clock at night. Hey, let's go to Sonic. Dump the truck. Let's go. Yeah. Like, I'm a softy. I cry at movies. I cry watching like the really good stories of American Idol and like America's Got Talent. Yeah. I'll, then I'll cry because I'm mm-hmm. I get it. Like mm-hmm. I and especially when it comes to, like them losing a parent or something. I've lived that, so it kind of makes you almost like relive it, but like not really. But yeah, it makes you just look like they overcame. You overcame. There's so many stories out there that I wish that could be told. Well, I think a lot of people do that. They they blame their lifestyle, is. their life choices. Yeah. I went through this, and that's really common now, not taking accountability and all that. Yeah. Um, it's a very common thing. Absolutely. You know, before I had this stepmother, I had another stepmother, and uh, she was crazy. 
And I mean that in the most respect that I, that's the nicest thing I could say about her. Yeah. Um, and you were how old during that time? Well, I was 11. Okay. And, um, no, I was, yeah, I was 11. It was rough. I think it was one of those things. My dad wanted somebody to raise the kid, help him raise the kids. I get it. Totally. 100% do from seeing it now. Yeah. I get that. Yeah. I totally do. And and I never hated my dad for it or faulted him for it or anything else. I've got a great stepmother now. Mm -hmm. I mean, she is amazing. She helps us. She takes, you know, she's good to Gracie. She's good to my brother's, uh, my nephew, my brother's boy. Uh, you know, that's that's grandmother they don't know anything else mm -hmm. and so that's that's pretty awesome um you know and, and here's another thing that it's not really getting off subject but like it's kind of cool that i got to marry somebody that knew my mom mm. so that was kind of cool like she actually knew knew my mom mm -hmm. like it wasn't just like oh i seen your mom in passing no i mean she talked to my mom when she was a little kid all the time like because she died when I was in fourth grade and my brother was in sixth grade. My wife and my brother were in the same graduating class. Oh, okay. And so she got to talk to my mom and they went on field trips together and stuff. My mom loved her. So it was one of the, it's kind of cool that I married somebody that knew my mom. Does that, you know what I'm saying? Because like, yes. I could have married anybody from anywhere. They wouldn't know who my mom was. They just have to take my word for it. Right. And for somebody to share the same experiences that I got to share as a kid, that my mom was a great person, it kind of is pretty cool. Well, I think, too, they can comfort you in those moments. So moments of weakness and all that, they can relate to you in Absolutely. that way. Mm. Yeah, I really yeah. do. That's good stuff, man. I didn't, I didn't actually know that about your wife, that she knew your mom and yeah. all that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so having a step-parent and stuff, you said the the first one wasn't so great, but uh, having a step-mom now. It's uh, great, is yeah. 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 Treat um, her pretty much like a mother. Oh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I mean... She, you know, she don't say step, step son. It's my son, Adam right. and Josh. And, uh, you know, so, and, and she's, she's, she's just a good part. She helps a lot of people mm -hmm. behind closed doors. She's got a big heart. She don't want a lot of people to know that, but she really does. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, she, she does a good job. Well, you said not my stepson, my son. And I think that's the way a lot of, uh, if you have a stepchild, yeah. I think that's the way to kind of, you know, make them a part of your family. Yep. Um, they're not a stepchild. They no. are your child if you marry yep. into that. Absolutely. I think that's really, really important. Um, going good, man. Over an hour we're set. Um, spiritual life, your faith, uh, yeah. everything else. So kind of talk about, were you raised in a Christian household, yeah. would you say? Okay. Absolutely. Talk about your faith journey and what that was like when you were saved. Uh, were you Baptist? A denomination? You know, I or? was. I'm not, but I was. Mm -hmm. Um you know, I grew up uh, Cherry Street Baptist Church, and I went to Cross Point. Um, and I've had some really good people in my life. Uh, a lot of my dad's friends are are really great men, mm -hmm. and so I've had a lot of great men to look up to. Um, and some guys don't get that opportunity in life to see how men actually handle themselves. Uh, so that's, that's helped me in life that I still have a connection with a bunch of these men. I call them uncle. They're not my dad's friends. I call them uncle. Like mm -hmm. that's what I, I they're, they're that close to us. I still talk to three or four of them on a daily basis. Pick in their brain. Hey, what would you do here? Some of them have great girls, you know, raised girls. And I, I try to pick their brain, man. Mm -hmm. Um, how would you handle that? You know, I mean, so, um, yeah, I, I got raised in a great home. Um, you know, my dad, he preaches now at Word Alive International Church down in uh, Old Water, Alabama. Okay. Um, he's not the head pastor. That's Kent Maddox. But my dad does help preach down there some on certain sermons and stuff that they want him to do. Um, but now, you know, I've, I'm have i non-denominational, if that makes sense. I don't put a logo on it. Sure. Um, you, you don't look in the Bible and go, oh, he's Baptist. Oh, right. he's Catholic. Oh, he's Methodist. That's right. No, he's a Christian. That's right. Uh, I, I wished, and I think that's where we struggle as, I don't want to piss anybody off, but nah, I'll let them have it. <laughs> uh, I think having denominations in church is a joke. Mm -hmm. Um, well, don't you think denominations, why they were created? Because they wanted to fit theirs their and way. theirs and theirs and theirs. Their it's way. like, Hey, look, like now, listen, I know some great men that are Baptist preachers. Sure. I know some great men that are Catholic preachers, Methodists. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's not 
there's no religion like that. Does that make sense? Like that, mm-hmm. I go to nomina- not I go to church, there's no denomination, okay? Right. I go to Word of Life some too, but it's so far of a drive for me to go. Mm. We we go up to a church in Boaz called Bridge Church. Mm-hmm. And uh, Chris Bartlett's the pastor. He's amazing. And um man, it is uh he opened my eyes a lot to some things, you know, just just listening to him talk. I'd go home and think about it. Like just a deep thought. And um, you know, and I've I've said it since I was a kid, like, why is there denominations? Like, it's don't make no sense. We all believe in the same God, right? Right. You know, I mean, like if you're a Christian, you're Christian. Like I that's agree. just it's just how it is. Like there's mm-hmm. not another God that you believe in. You can't go over here and worship Allah over here and want to be worshiping Jesus at the same time. That don't you know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> the Muslims worship one. You know. They have mm-hmm. one faith, one thing that they worship. That's right. And we want to put God in five or six different denominations. And it's like, why are we doing that? That's a good point. Why, why are we putting him in? <clears throat> oh, you're a Catholic. No, man, <laughs> I'm a Christian. That's what I am. Right. And and I think that right there, uh, if we, I, I think that also pushes people away from the church. It does. Um, well, cr- well, Christianity is not really supposed to be a religion. It's a relationship with Christ. With yeah. And so I think that's kind of where we got lost in all the denominations and all 100%. that. We've lost the focus, right? Yeah. The, the, the goal is to have a relationship with Christ. And you're not starting all this other to stuff. see, this could just be me, but you're starting to see more churches leave certain denominations. Mm-hmm. Uh, Boat, the or we go now was Church of God and they left. It, mm-hmm. um, it pushes people away. Well, if we're all following the Bible and what we're supposed to do, where is the confusion? That's that's what I'm. Yeah. But I think it's we, just like you said, people as want their man, life. it's a. I'll say it. It's a man-made religion, right? We wanted it to make the fit the way we thought. Yeah, and it's not about. That. Mm-hmm. You know, um, that's that's just the way I think. Now, hey, I could be totally wrong, right? I could I could be one hundred percent wrong, and I'm and I will be fine with it. Mm-hmm. I'm cool with being wrong, but I don't think I'm wrong about that. Sure. Um, you know, uh, growing up from going from Baptist and I went to cross point and then I went to word live. I've seen things happen that you cannot explain, but God, mm-hmm. not having to go into detail, but, but God. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, wow, that just happened. You can't explain it. And I think it's one of those things. That especially nowadays, if they can't see it, touch it, or feel it, it ain't real, right? Until it happens to them, mm-hmm. and I I think that that needs to happen more. I think there needs to be a spiritual awakening, hundred mm-hmm. percent. Uh, am I a perfect Christian? No. Well, I'm perfect, and you know, but <laughs> <laughs> my wife she's a work in progress. Right. But no, man, I, I'm far from perfect. I'm a daily work in progress. We all are. Sometimes I get absolutely just ticked off and I have to go separate myself from somebody for I hurt their feelings. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I don't have all the answers and I love to hear other people's opinions. That's how we grow. And, you know, if you can hear other people's opinions about things or how they view something or how they see something, it may enlighten you on further in your life. So I don't act like I know it all all the time. Mm-hmm. I like to listen to other people. And so I think that's helped me grow in my spiritual life too. get to listen to other people, mm-hmm. their spiritual journey. The biggest thing for me is testimony because everybody's got one. You've got one. I've got one. Sure. And some people's testimonies are so powerful because you can relate. I think everybody can relate to just about everybody in some aspect of their life or their timeline of their life. They can relate with it. Mm-hmm. And I don't think we do it as well as we should as a Christian faith that we share our journey. I don't think we share it enough in churches. Well, the lack of vulnerability because people are scared they're going to air it out and all that. 100%. I think that's a lot of what it is, too. Well, you know, here's the thing. Pastors are not perfect. Yeah. Some people would just say, you know what? I'm I'm going to share my testimony as a pastor. What I had to go through in my life to get to where I am today. Because you could literally rock somebody's socks off back there in the back pew, as they say, 
and could change their life forever. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes people look at pastors and think, oh gosh, they're, they're almost perfect. You know, they, they don't make mistakes like, or how they wouldn't do that. Or no, they don't struggle with anything. They struggle daily. Mm -hmm. Just like we all do. Just like we all do. We've yeah. got to stop. The, and this is where I think that we've pushed people away because we put all these pastors and everybody on these huge pedestals. And obviously, yes, I understand they are put up into that position because that's what their calling was. I totally understand. And God ordains it and all yeah. that. Yes. But I also understand that they're a man. That's right. And God didn't say on the cross, it's finished, but you know what I'm saying? It's, it's finished, but these pastors are perfect. No, oh, man. He's just like me and you. Mm -hmm. He's going to have the same struggles that I've had, you've had. We may not have had a struggle that he's had. That's right. And so this is going to touch a subject. Some of these Southern Baptists, but I'm a big old boy. Hey, man, gluttony is a big thing. Yeah. We don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. We we try to just sleep around the road because it's not what makes us feel better. That's right. And so. Well, gluttony is the, is the same as adultery. It's the same as lying, cheating. and But we don't want to sin talk about Sin is sin. That's right. We try to paint a picture of this sin's worse than this one. I mean, look, in human, in human reasoning, uh, we look at it that way. Sure. Well, I think logically, like, killing somebody might be the ultimate terrible I mean, thing you know, and all that. But in God's eyes, the biblical still is loves the same. Him. Yeah. And, yeah. Then, and that's the most. This is where I have. This is where, as us humans. Do not understand God's actual true love for us. We can say we do, but truly, if I walked up to somebody and killed somebody right there in front of you, so your your wife or your whoever, I, I would have a hard time not killing you. And God would still love them even after of what they've done. Right. You know, they could still repent. At, from what I this is from what I believe. Still get saved. They still go to heaven. Okay, yeah, well, Saul uh, was a murder, right? Paul turned it on. Uh, same thing. Yeah. I mean, some of the greatest ministers the, yeah. were, were some of the biggest sinners. You know, I've always said this, and people look at me like I'm crazy sometimes. God didn't come for the people that's got it all together. Mm. God came for the stripper. Yeah. The drug addict. The adulterer. Person likes to eat too much gluttony. Yeah. He came for those people. Now, this is what ticks me off about churches. Not all of them are this way, but you do have some of them. God came for everybody, just like he came for you sitting in that church pew. I don't care if you come in and you look like you're homeless. If God sent you there for a reason. So we should love that person while they're there. And I think we have a hard time doing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, not every church is like that, okay? Not saying that that is the case. But I think what we have done is, as a way it's portrayed to some people that don't grow up in Christian homes or don't, you know, believe in the Christian faith, oh, once you're a Christian, you got to be perfect. Yeah. Man. It's and it's almost like you get in your impossible. mind that you, when you struggle, you feel guilty. Like you're still human. You have flesh, right? Yeah. Biblically, we talks about that. We're all going to struggle. We're all going to gravitate towards sin. Yeah. We're all going to do stuff every single day. Every day. Um, but I think a lot of teenage youth and stuff, they really struggle with that. They do. Uh, like still having the flesh in them. Yeah. The desires and all that. But you're a human being. Well, that's uh, you're, you're not an ethereal being. You know, that's that's perfect. when you're you're growing the most. Right. That's when your brain is not fully developed. You're, you're still growing, you know, into your t early 20s. I mean... So your 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 thinking's a little different. Uh, right. You don't know how to think logically on certain things because you're you're like, I oh, don't make no sense to me. Mm -hmm. Um But I know adults that still struggle with that. You know, it's like when they yeah, everybody when they have lust or they have yeah. whatever, it's like they feel terrible. Like it yeah. ruins their day. Yeah. And it's like you're a human being. Like yeah. we don't act on everything, of yep. course, but Absolutely. we're human being. We have fleshly desires. Hey, listen, yeah. have I looked at somebody before and they've ticked me off and I want to bounce their head off concrete? Yes. Yeah. Have I wanted to do some stupid crap before to somebody? Absolutely. I can't help that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's just a thought. Yeah. Like, nobody's perfect. And, and mm -hmm. I wish we would get out of this mindset. I shouldn't say we, but I wish people would get out of the mindset that, hey, if you're a Christian, you got to be perfect. That's right. No, man. No, no. Well, it almost Go read in the it. Bible how many people he went and helped. <laughs>
that nobody wanted to talk to. That was like, oh, why would you talk to them? They're a prostitute, basically. Yeah. Why not? Those are the ones that need saving. Mm-hmm. Well, w- once you're saved and you're a Christian, you want to further yourself, as in learning more about Christ and God. You want to learn as much as you possibly can. And you're, you're going to fail every day. And you've got to come to the realization it's okay. Mm-hmm. It, it's okay to fail because that's going to make you a better person the next day. That's right. And you may still struggle with it for a little bit. You're a work in progress. Everybody's a work in progress. Your pastors, hey guys, they're works in progress. They don't know everything. And, you know, just because they can quote scripture, that's great. So can other, a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And so I, I do think that as a Christian, You've got to try your hardest as you can to live a good Christian life. And I don't every day. Hey, I'm mm. going to be honest with you. Sometimes I'm like, hey, listen, I was a jack A. You know what? I mean, like, I showed my rear end when I wasn't supposed to, and I apologize. Mm-hmm. Every day. I mean, it's a, it, it shouldn't, it's not, I shouldn't say a struggle, but, you know, how many times has people been sitting there and like, you know, it's God's voice talking to, and you just totally do the opposite thing? Yeah. Is he going to strike you down there? No. He knows you're not. He knows you're going to mess up. And I think that's where we struggle as Christians because we're like, oh, he's perfect. That's why God sent his son to die for us. That's right. And then that's what I want people to realize. It's, it's more about you having the relationship with Christ. Because it don't matter how dark it gets, his light will shine brighter than that darkness. Well, you walk into a church and every single person in that church is broken. Yeah, or they wouldn't Mm -hmm. have to be there. We all are. And so I don't know where that came from, where, you know, it's almost like they're on a a pedestal. Even Mm -hmm. they are. They look down and say, I'm a Christian. I've never understood where that was. I'll tell you this. I work in the food industry. We've we've discussed that earlier. Right. Every one of my customers that's a restaurant, they hate Sundays. Yeah. They hate dealing with the church crowd because the church crowd feel like they're owed something and they don't tip worth a crap. Why? Why? We should be sharing the gospel with people. That's right. Those people are there working on Sundays to feed you, to serve you. They're not dirt because they didn't get to go to church. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think that's a problem with some, some people just are just so rude because they've never had to work in that side of the industry yep. or maybe never had to hold a job. And they're just rude to people. Well, that person working on Sunday. Do you think they want to work on Sunday? Right. But they no. might have to do that they just to, to pay their bills. That's like 100%. they're not going to live yeah. if they don't, you know, and so, so they, can, they don't have an option to go to church. I said exactly. Right. And so, I, you know. A lot of people work, do church online. They watch it online. Watch it, you know. And I don't listen. We, I think you need to go to church, obviously. But you you can't just put God in a box. Mm-hmm. God's not just at church. God could be sitting in a crack house somewhere, saving somebody's life. Mm-hmm. He could be sitting at a bar next to somebody, and you share Jesus with them. You, you can't put a, any type of parameters on when God's going to move and when he's going to say now. You can't. Because if we're supposed to do it, we're supposed to do it. And, I, I, and listen, I've been in the middle of the Walmart before, and God's wanted me to talk to somebody, and I'm like, I ain't doing it. You're freaking crazy. Like, what, what are you talking about? And so I struggle with that because um, it's an inconvenience, right? Mm-hmm. You don't want to talk to some stranger. I mean. You can see they're struggling with something, or and they got a heaviness on them, man. With the because with the gift of discernment, I've got the gift of discernment. You can see stuff on people. You can, and so uh, I struggle with that. I actually sit there and go, man, they like. Do you really want me to talk to her about that? Or do you really want me to talk to him about that? You well, know, I, I was in Mo's uh, Mo Monday. Go yeah. and get a read on that. And there was a guy getting salsa at the little thing, and I could tell. He just kind of, he used to kind of somber a little bit. I was like, hey, man, you doing all right? 
He's like, not really. My brother just passed away yesterday. You know, I felt that yeah. to talk to him. I felt that pull, um, you know, the Holy Spirit inside you working and all that. And that's not to say anything about me. That's just yeah. showing what God is. I don't know this guy. No. I have no clue, but uh, no clue. But I heard I felt the call, you know, and I answered and that made his day so much better. I could tell it changed him and and uh, kind of uplifted. And I just spoke to him and said, hey, to him and all that. Um, you really need to listen to that call when the spirit you calls do. you for and, sure. Man, with my job, obviously, I'm out and about all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, I've had to sit down with my customers, and that, and my customers will tell me stuff that I don't need to know. Yeah, you know, but they feel like they can tell me because mm-hmm. I've got that relationship. Right. And you know, uh, I'll pray for my customers. I mean, like, it's a big thing for me because. Um, I can kind of use that as a platform. You know, I get to see so many I, hundreds of people a day that I come in contact with in different counties and stuff. Um, and get to share some of my testimony with some of my customers. Well, or, you don't have to be a pastor, it. you no, know, to to minister don't. to people. You know, I see patients. Yeah. Um, see people every single day. You know, yeah. I can influence them and and cheer them up and really share the gospel with them without even saying anything. Mm-hmm. You know, just who you are, just Holy Spirit yeah. working through you. And so it, there, there's a lot, um, you know, that happens and, uh, I've went through so much stuff with work and my life before. I mean, like not everybody knows this, but, uh, when I was, I was 17, I had, uh, Tommy John surgery. Oh, wow. And, uh, when I was playing baseball at Ada wall and, uh, I had surgery in, March and uh, Word Alive used to come up and do a church over in Glencoe uh, on Sunday nights. And so I would go. Well, I was mad at God because I love baseball, man. I love baseball so much. And uh, I was a pitcher and I played center field. Wasn't amazing, but I could, I was pretty good. And, um, you know, when that got taken away, I was like, all right, you took my mom at 10. Now you're taking this from me. Like, what in the crap have I done wrong? You know, I mean, you start questioning. And so I was like, I, I don't know. Like, this is just ticking me off. And uh, it was a Sunday night. I wanted to stay home, watch TV. My dad was like, no, you're going to go. Well, I want to go. Anyway, long story short. Now, man, I'm in an arm brace. Like, I'm in a 90 degree cast, okay? With an art, you know, an arm brace on, because they didn't really want me doing a whole lot with it. You know, sure. I'm still going to rehab, but they want to make sure everything was stable. Like, it's a very extensive surgery. Like, it's not just like, oh, it's you'll be okay. I mean, you're talking a year of rehab mm-hmm. of probably three or four days a week worth. And uh, man, I was, I want to say it was sometime in May, and uh, I was just sitting there and. Pastor at Word Alive, Kent Maddox. I was standing by a pole in uh in this church. It was just a pole in the sanctuary. I'm like, I wish I'd wrap this crap up. Like I was ready to get home. I wanted to eat something and go to bed. And uh, man, he he looked at me a bunch of time during the service, and I just never thought nothing of it. You know, whatever. Well, uh, at the end of the service, he goes, he's sitting there in altar call, you know. And, People's coming down. He stops and he says, hey, you stand by that pole. Now, now listen, this was 15 years ago. Oh, wow. Uh, four, 15 years ago. He did not know who my dad was at the time. Did not know who I was at the time. Never met the man. Never spoke a word to this man. He said, you're being healed right now. Well, actually, this was before he said that. I looked and I turned around. He said, no, the one that just turned around, you, right there, with the brace on. He's like, you're being healed right now in the name of Jesus. And he just went like this. Only thing I remember is seeing his hand. I was out like a lot. Mm. I wake up and I'm like, oh my God, what just happened? Man, I had this warm sensation just hit. You got it, man. Take your time. 
Oh, it hits me every time. Hit me, man, like a freight train. And I woke up and I was like, what just happened? And I was like, did I actually get healed? Because I don't know. I woke up and I was crying. I was like, what is going on? And so <clears throat> I sit there and of course I'm like, what's really does me well. Mm-hmm. Now, bro, I didn't have but 90. I didn't, this was it. Yeah. This was as far as I can move my arm. I had full range of motion. Which it don't mean a lot to some people. They're like, well, he had surgery. No kidding. Guys, I don't think y'all understand when I say Tommy John surgery is extensive. You don't get full range of motion back after the first month. Right. It's impossible. Impossible. I still went to my rehab and did everything I was doing. I was just making everything stronger because it was paid for. You know what I'm saying? Like, I was sure. getting it taken care of. Why not go ahead and just do this thing and get everything? Just I'm talking. It's the reason I've got big four. Mm-hmm. So, really, that's where everything started of like me really taking it more serious working out. Mm-hmm. I wanted to build everything up because I didn't want to get hurt again. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wasn't going to be able to play my senior year of baseball. Um, I got to play my senior year of baseball. Um, and, I, you know, it was crazy. It was just one of those things. God did that. I didn't do it. Kent Maddox didn't do it. God worked through Kent Maddox because he had a word of knowledge. Mm-hmm. And he was obedient. And, uh, man, it th- that changed my life more than anything. Because I went, whoa, that's a different aspect of God. Like, that is totally different. Hey, I've been saved since I was 13 years old. Still this day, I've ne- nothing like that has happened to me. But on that chosen Sunday night, I got turned off like a light switch and woke up and I was healed. I can't explain it. It's God. It's not. It, no doctor was there to help me or anything else. That's just what happened. It was crazy. That's amazing, man. And just so that story is uh, is touching. It's sure. it's one of those things when people. Yeah, well, let me say it. this. People say now they may hear that story and be like, God does it. That used to, he used to do miracles. Well, he used still does to. Every day. Yeah. So you would say he every still day. does. Well, yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. every day. I mean, all right. Say you don't, but if you're thinking about it, let's say you're driving down the road. You drop your phone in the floorboard. You're searching for it. You can't find it. It slid up underneath the seat. You knew it slid up underneath the seat. And you can't get to it to your next stop, but you're still trying. But something tells you to raise your head up and swerve over before you have a head-on collision. Mm. That's God. Yeah. It's not your time. Like It is just not your time. Um, well, I've seen, you know, worked emergency medicine six yeah. years, you know, so many accidents and people come out unscathed. I mean, just untouched. Yeah. 100%. And then you should be, like, you should be mauled. Yeah. yeah. And they come out. Um, it's real, man. It, it is. God's about his... He's real as rain. It's like what everybody says. He's real as rain. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think once you have a personal account, once something happens to oh, you and dude, you have yeah. that kind of moment, uh, you, you know, it was funny little... because when I was get when I was raised, I would see the Benny Hinn stuff, obviously, and I was like, oh, whatever, Benny. Okay, I've seen it in person. It's insane. It's incredible. Um, when he does the thing with his jacket, mm-hmm. over, it's real. This ain't a joke. Um, I've been laid out by Benny twice because actually Kent and Benny are their best friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was under Benny for 20 something years. Um, and to see things, and I, I kind of knew it was real before that even happened to me because I've seen it happen before and I've watched it on TV. Mm-hmm. People laying hands on people and praying for people. And man, when it happens to you though, It'll change you. Like, it'll be like, oh, like I've never felt that. And I, and I, fe- obviously now I know what it feels like. I felt God before hundreds and millions of times. Um, Help me in situations in my own life. Mm-hmm. I mean, man, even with my job, um, you know, I, I try to look at places. I won't go into certain places unless I've prayed about it. And I do it in my truck when mm-hmm. I'm driving by. I'll pray about a place while I'm just driving by. I don't just do it sitting at the house or anything. I want it to be my time. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I don't want people putting doubt into my head. Like, no, I shouldn't do that. I want to hear it as clear as possible. It was me and God in the truck. There's no radio playing. Sometimes I got music playing and I can still, obviously it's just me and God talking. I do a lot of that when I'm driving down the road and it keeps, I should say sanity. I'm not, neat. I'm not crazy or anything, but it keeps me going, man. Mm-hmm. Um, that relationship that I can just sit there and have a conversation just like me and you talking. People don't realize you don't have to say anything spectacular for God to love you. And so it's one of those things like I sit there and go, oh, I can carry on a conversation with the creator. You know, I was like, he's the beginning and he is the end. I was like, and we can just sit here and talk to him like he's in the room with us. And he's searching for a relationship with yeah. you. You know, which and is he's right there. People just don't even understand. He, he wants a relationship. Well, I think that's what a lot of people struggle with too. You don't know what I've done. Yeah. You don't know what I've been through, yeah. what I've done, but he still loves you anyway. He loves you anyway. Yeah. I mean, so it, it, it does matter. Um, you know, when people get that relationship and hey, and, and my relationship's not perfect. Nobody's right. Nobody's is. And there's some things that I still struggle with sometimes. And it's just like, oh, you know better. And you try to not do it again. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, this, the relationship is so key in everything that you do. Once you've gotten to a point to where, you know, God's going to take care of you. It helps you. Mm-hmm. It makes you kind of the angst. I shouldn't, I don't have any anxiety, but I know people struggle with it. Sure. And well, it gives you that confidence, and that peace. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, man, I, I've been sitting there before uh, from doing what I do now and to where I was going to quit. And I was like, I can't do this. Mm-hmm. I was like, you know, this been going on two years. You want me to build a territory. Uh, you're paying me a base salary that now that wouldn't pay anything. This is eight years, seven years ago. Uh, luckily at the time, my wife had, she had a good job. Um, so we made ends meet, uh, you know, and at the time we were living above uh, my father-in-law shop and an apartment, make everything, make ends meet. We were wanting to build a house and we ended up doing that mm. a couple of years ago. And, um, but we lived there. And I'm beyond thankful for that Um, because they help with Gracie and um, and everything. And, uh, you know, it helped me, you know, make my career what it is today because I couldn't have done it without it. Yeah. Um, So having that reassurance like, hey, like you can live up there. It's not a problem. That was huge. Um, You know. My wife, we talked, and it was year two, and, man, I didn't bring hardly anything home. It was January 1st, or and I got my paycheck. And I, I was sitting up in a tree stand down South Alabama, just lost it, man, just crying. I'm like, I can't do this anymore. Like, this ain't going to work. This ain't cutting it. I'm like, God, you told me this is what I was supposed to be doing. And, and we, we prayed about it. then? I was working for Wood Frutiger. Okay. And it was year two. And I'm like, this is what you wanted me to do. And I'm not getting it done. Like, this is ridiculous. Like, I started questioning. And, you know, and I had a conversation with my dad on the way back from the hunting club. And he said, well, son, I understand if, you know, you don't want to do this. I said, no, dad, I love my job. I said, you know, I don't want to sit here and struggle. I said, but, you know, I said, I don't want to work in a factory either. Not knocking factories out. But I'm not made for that. Right. If I had to do it, would I do it? Absolutely, because that's what my family would need. Right. I'll do anything to make my family happy and keep them safe. Absolutely, 100%. Make it where they don't have to struggle. Yeah. And uh, went home, talked to my wife, and she'd been praying about it, and we'd been praying about it. And just, man, I just didn't know where I wanted to go. And, uh, man, it was about a month and a half, two months after all that. Still there. And then it just took off like wildfire. I mean, I I actually got to share my testimony on it at Word Alive. And uh, life changing. With with me actually having a wife that prays for you on a daily basis, stands behind you, encourages you. It's key. Yeah. 100%. Uh, behind every strong man is a stronger woman. So without her, I wouldn't be who I am today. Mm-hmm. So 
she gets a lot of behind the scenes. You know, she she does everything behind the scenes. Uh, everybody looks like, look what he did. And like, if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be at where I am today. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't be at Woodford. I'd be working somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Um, and it has blessed us by her pushing me and encouraging me. We got to build the house that she always wanted. Like I said, she always wanted. <laughs> Owned the property. She wanted to live there. I fought it and fought it and fought it. And I was like, you know what? That's what we're going to do. I'm cool with it. And I let her, I shouldn't say let, but I said, baby, I don't care what mm-hmm. you do with the house. You build it however you want to build it. You get it done however you want to get it done. Because God has blessed us enough to say, hey, look, do what you want. Mm-hmm. And we took that opportunity. And we did a lot of work ourselves on certain things. Her dad is phenomenal at building things. And so we, we put our own little spin on some stuff. Um, and she built the house the way she wanted it. And to see that come true for her was huge. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, I, like I told her, I said, I don't care what the house looks like. Like, I want it to look good, yeah. But I mean, oh, God, I get you and Gracie. Like, we living on dirt and floors. I don't care. Right. You know, and and she, I don't care what she decorates because what she's going to do is going to be beautiful. I don't care. Mm-hmm. and so I, she's like I want to do, I'm, go knock yourself out and you know but without her pushing me standing behind me we wouldn't have that today I agree with that statement behind every good man is a is a great woman that's 100%. for sure mm-hmm. 100% for sure. and a lot of the men get all the praise before the women does yeah and and some women don't care and then some women are like you know I think as men I think we think like most of us are the providers right and you got some women that stay at home, but we don't want to be staying at home and having to deal what they deal with. Yeah, it. absolutely. And not. so there's, there's, you got to give and you got to take. And I think that's where me and my wife do pretty well. Uh, I love to cook. Mm-hmm. I love to cook. I grew up in a restaurant family, food industry. Everybody's in food in my family. Mm-hmm. And so we love to cook. And man, I got smokers, I got grills, I got flat tops, I got, you know, and so we cook almost every night, man. Mm. And I love it. Chicken, steak, pork, brisket. I don't care. I'll cook it. I'll smoke it. I don't care. That's great. And so I, when some men are like, yeah, my wife's got to have the food ready on the table. And I'm like, why can't you cook for her sometimes? That's right. Because I watched my dad do it. Mm-hmm. And so I, me growing up in that, that atmosphere, I don't think nothing about me cooking. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like sometimes I'm like, "Hey, baby, you want to cook?" She's like, "No," and I was like, "I don't want to. Let's go get something." Mm-hmm. Uh, or, "Hey, can we just throw something in the air fryer?" You know, I mean, something simple. We ain't mm-hmm. gotta have you know four course meals. Like, sure. I mean, you know, sure. We ain't gotta have your meatloaf, your mashed potatoes, and your cornbread and all that other stuff going with. I don't care. Yeah, just give me something a little bit, and we'll be fine. Um. But yeah, I think working together is key. That's the key. And that's uh, the key to making a happy marriage. I mean, like, there's some men that will never cook a supper for their wife. Their wife handles it all. Yeah. Which is, hey, hey, each his own, right? Mm -hmm. But do you realize what it would do for her if you did it one time? Yeah. Just to say, hey, babe, I know I've worked all day. Go sit down. I've got this. Lead by example. That would be huge. Or, hey, babe, uh, and this is what I struggle with because I hate laundry. Let me let me get that laundry for you. Just just go sit down. All right, let me let me clean that. Not saying that a woman's job is to do that, but women, by being women, they can't stand uncleanliness. Us as men, a little dirty. It's like we'll get to it later. Mm-hmm. My wife wants it done then. Mm-hmm. She ain't gonna wait. And so, you know, I help do the floor. I I'm a floor guy. I love the floors to be clean. I mop. Probably three times a week. Yeah. I mean, like, because we got all hardwoods and tile through the house. And so um, I try to help her on that. And it's not just like, oh, he's helping her. No, we're in this together. It's our house. Right. Am I going to ask her to go get on the tractor? No. Can she run it? Absolutely. But do I want her to? No, Mm -hmm. I do not. Do I want her cutting grass? No, I don't. Can she do it? 100%. My wife can do anything a man can do. 
She was raised by a very manly man, taught her how to do stuff. She can run saw, table saws. She can do it all. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things I'm really, I'm blessed to have a wife like that because it makes my life easier too. Because if I'm sick or I'm down, she can pick up the slack a little bit till I get better. Or in the same aspects with her. If she's sick or she's down, I can pick up the slack to make it better. Mm-hmm. And so you've got to work as a team. It, it's huge working it's, as a team. It's a team effort. That's it. Absolutely. So we're about to wrap up, man. Uh, been a pretty long episode. We had a lot of good stuff to talk about. Absolutely. Five, 10, 20 year plan. I end with this. Five years from now, you'll be how old? 37. 37. Where are you at five years from now? Um, Five years from now, which I, I'm not ever going to leave where I'm at. And everybody goes, man, why do you want to live there? I love my house. Um, I love it because we built it the way we wanted to. And we've got blood, sweat, and tears in the house. And we designed it to the way we can always remodel. Because it's open floor plan con- concept. You can always remodel. You can. There's not many walls. There's not much stuff you can do. We can always rip up the floors, put new floors down. We can always do something different cabinetry-wise. Because really, what do you do when you go to a new house? You're just going to get new things, right? Right. And so, five-year plan, I want to be completely debt-free. That's my goal. Awesome. Ten years from now, where are you at? What are you doing? Well, I'm still going to be working at Wood Vertiker. The money's pretty nice. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't make this much doing, um, doing anything else. I don't have a college degree. I didn't finish school. Um, I, I do pretty well. Uh, I've been blessed. Uh, my wife obviously has helped me along the way. She's got a great job. Um, and so, yeah, 10 years from now, I'm still there working at Wood Vertiger. God willing. Um, unless I hit the lottery. Yeah. Um, if you do share, please. 10 year plan, man. I would like to honestly, 10 years, which we're going to, Hopefully, we will start having or trying to have a child in January. Oh, right. So, 10-year plan. I mean, have, please, God, give me a boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want some man in my house. Yeah. If you give me a girl, hey, thank you. I'm bl- as, long as, they're, as long as they're healthy, I don't right. care. Right. Um, but, you know, I'm never really – I don't – 10-year plan. I want to have enough in the bank if something does happen crazy in this world. That I can live for, for ten years, fifteen years, mm-hmm. and not have to touch anything. Mm-hmm. And now we would you have to live a little bit on the minimal side? Yeah, but if you're debt free, you know what I'm saying. Right. You know where I'm coming from. Uh, you can live on two or three thousand dollars a month or less. Mm-hmm. If you're debt free. I don't think you got pays your utilities and stuff. And who says we have that? <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know that, that's the crazy thing to look at. But I'm yeah. just saying, I, I want to have and and I want to have enough cash. Liquid, as you could say, I, I want to have enough to where if something does happen to the banks, I'm fine. Yeah. I'm cool. Buying some gold, buying some silver. 20 years. I'd love to say retired, but like I said, I love my job. You'll be 30, 50, I'll be 52. 52. And 10 years, I mean, man, I, you can make a lot of, you can make really good money doing this. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I mean, 20 years from now, I don't think I'll be retired because it's not really hard on your body. Mm-hmm. Uh, now I need to get in better shape to be able to sustain what I need to be able to do to be able to provide for my family. But I, I do think that 20 years from now, I'll still be working, but I won't be working at 60. Not even close. I don't want to either. Hopefully I think I 50, for them. I think if everything can go right, which everything's going to have to. And nothing goes stupid in this world, which we can't predict. Right. Um, I'd like to be retired at 55. Mm-hmm. Completely just the, shut the, it the down. Issue, the issue with that is insurance. So like Medicare is at 65, whatever, and they, they keep wanting to push that age up and all It's that. according to how much money you can be able right. to draw. And then right. with my wife's job, I mean, she's kind of like does what I do, but it's a credit card and POS systems. So, um, and that's, you can make really good money doing it. So, um, you know. I might just pick that up on the side and just say, hey, I'm retired and I'll just do this on the side. I mean, mm-hmm. it's one of those things that if I could draw enough and make a six-figure income in retirement and you don't have to go anywhere, why not? Because mm-hmm. you don't know when you're going to die. Yeah. 
I feel sorry for people that work for till they're 75 and they die a year later. They never got to, they never really got to live like they wanted to. Yeah. And so I don't want to be that person. Uh, do I have it all together financially now? No, but could it be better? Yeah. But I'm commissioned salesman, so I've got to go out there and hustle and get it. Right. And so, you know, if you could make another hundred thousand dollars a year and you could just put it back, just do that for five years. You got a half a million with no investments. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I've got goals in the next five years to be completely debt free. That's awesome, man. Have the house paid off, have everything paid off the way I think it should be. And if it's not in five years, realistically, I want it to be five years. But if it's not, I'm okay with it because really I'd like for it to be at 40. Well, financial independence, that's a big uh, hot, hot word now. and uh, But it's a real thing. I mean, if you can be less dependent on everybody else, yeah. all the payments, all that. And well, you know, if you've got your mortgage, two car payments, and then you got all your utilities, you're that's three, lot. four thousand dollars $4,000 a month at right least, off the top. At least. And so now you're like, oh, crap. Well, now you're debt free. Guess what? You just save three, four thousand $4,000 a month without even trying to. And invest that, compound all that. And if you want to go buy a vehicle, you can go pay cash for it more than likely. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the whole thing. That's where I want to get to. Because I don't have to buy brand new trucks and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I got a 2018. It's five years old. Yeah. Um, I've had it for a couple of years now. But like, still, like, I'd like to be able to just go, yeah, I want that. You know, I want to get to that point where it's like, that's what I want. Mm, yeah, I got a Tundra. And hopefully it'll last. My plan is it for it to last 20 years, oh, yeah. hopefully. Yeah. Maybe longer. Yeah, Toyotas don't die. Yeah, they don't die. I know, man. I know. That's why I got one. Well, that's it, dude. I really enjoyed this. Absolutely. This was, was awesome. Thanks for going in on everything. Yeah. Being uh, vulnerable and all that. I think a lot of people are going to get a lot from this. Well, I yeah. hope so. Appreciate it. Got to see a side of me that nobody really gets to see. So that's just one of those things, you man. You saw it here first. Exclusive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Never done a podcast before. So it's we been did great. great, man. You're a natural for sure. Thank you guys for watching The Better Man with Dr. Jared Nelson. We are on YouTube. Like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell. You're going to get all my videos directly to you. We're on every single audio podcast streaming platform. Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Give us that five-star rating because we give five-star service. Thanks for watching. Until the next one, peace. That's it, dude. That was awesome. Yeah, good. I appreciate you going in on that stuff. I wasn't expecting the the emotional stuff there. Yeah, man, but it was good. It was good.